Good morning, and welcome to Brewing Happiness. Grab yourself a cup of coffee. Mm. Whatever you love to drink in the morning, right? Or, or whatever time of day it is for you. Whatever you love to have a little brew of. And let's chat. I um, love puzzles. I don't know about you. I love all puzzles. I like video game puzzles like Tetris. I like Sudoku. I like word search. I like crossword puzzles. Uh, my most favorite, though, is jigsaw puzzles. My, the most favorite thing for me is jigsaw puzzles. They calm my mind. Kind of. Uh, maybe I'll do a show sometime on just jigsaw puzzles themselves because they because I love them so much. But it's just how my mind works, right? See patterns everywhere. I uh, I like putting things together. I like like making connections that don't happen naturally that just kind of occur to me. So years ago, I started my professional career in sales. I'm chatty. Sales was a normal place for me to go. I come from a, a background of sales. And uh, that's how I got to California. I uh, worked for a company in the Midwest that serviced the company in California and the contract moved to on site and I was invited and relocated out here to be a part of it. Yay, I came to California. Um, but it seems that they that I recognized that even at the time I um, I was still in sales, right? The, the job that moved me was still in sales. But even at the time I approached sales as a problem solver, right? When I first introduced to my territory, I just solved problems for everyone. And I knew that I didn't ask for sales. I didn't ask, you know, didn't do much, but just let people know I was the expert in their area solving problems. And when they trust you to solve their problems, they'll, they, they trust you to handle their sales. And that was my philosophy and it worked pretty well. Right. So I came to California. I, I got promoted. Um, and even though I was in sales and managing a team of salespeople, I always seemed to get involved behind the scenes, right? In the area where you're looking at operations and putting things together and how does this system connect to that and who owns what piece of business and how does how do things move through the chain? And I don't know, that seemed normal to me. I've always been figuring things out since I was a little kid. I can't look at things without trying to figure them out. And they started this series of problem solving classes where I worked. It was a Japanese company, big top-down uh, project that started at the co corporate headquarters and everybody had to participate and managers had to pick people to go to these beginning classes to get the thing started. Nobody wanted to go to this stuff. Everybody sounded like torture to them, but I volunteered because it sounded like fun to me. And indeed it was. And through the course of this, what happened was, uh, through this course of a series of classes and problem solvings, I moved out of sales and into operations and my job changed. But what was really more important was my life changed. Um, it started to color the way I looked at everything, not just business. I learned and was trained on a set of problem solving tools and a set of methods that made so much sense to me that I thought the problem doesn't matter. The process is the same. The process for how I figure out a problem is the same process, no matter who I'm talking to or what the problem is. And that was very powerful to me. I felt like I got a, a big gun that I could point at any problem and solve it. And I learned to partner with business owners, uh, department owners, they knew their business. I knew the business of problem solving and together we made an excellent team and figured things out. Um, this did not, this made perfect sense to me. When I was in high school, I was in the theater. I started off acting, but I ended up loving directing. Directing was what the, the power was for me. Acting, you just get to be in charge of one part, right? One person. Directing, meh, you get to be a part of everything. You get to you get to have a say in how it all works together as a whole. And that's always what's very exciting to me. Uh, I'm a big picture thinker, right? Like I said, I like to think of things in, uh, in, in totality in the whole. 
And so I learned some basic tools for problem solving. Now, the definition of a problem is something that has to be solved or it's an unpleasant or undesirable condition that needs to be corrected. Very simple, right? And these are as true in business, or I should say these are as true in our personal lives as they are in business. Um, an example of a problem is when it's raining and you don't have an umbrella, right? And you start thinking in terms of the problem itself. I'm getting wet. The problem isn't that you don't have an umbrella. The problem is that you're getting wet, right? You have to be, learn to talk about problems. Anyway, it changed my entire life. Changed the way I think. Changed the way I approach issues. Um, eventually, to fast forward a little bit, I, I became uh, an expert and a, a continuous improvement expert, quality process engineer. And that was my job, solving problems all day long, every day. And then one day I decided to take that methodology and apply that towards my personal life, not just for how to improve the number of widgets that successfully come off the manufacturing line, but I applied the same tools. Again, the problem doesn't matter. The process is the same. So I started applying some of these things to my personal life. And interestingly enough, it eventually uh, changed my life. I, I made a lot of big life changes and became the queen of happiness. So I'm going to say it was a successful little experiment. But what I was well steeped in or what I proposed and what I offer is data-driven decision-making, right? Solving a problem is about understanding the problem and using the data at your hands to figure this out. Now, that sounds really scary. Data sounds like spreadsheets and in charts and graphs. And I know for some of us, we go, yay. But others of you, most of you, I've seen your eyes glaze over. I've seen your eye. I've seen you roll your eyes at me when I start talking about things like this. I understand that it, that um, charts and graphs and statistics are not for everyone, but that's okay because data, don't be afraid of data. It's really just organized information. Data is just the what you learn put into a way that it will yield some information about your problem. So it's not that scary, right? It can be complicated or it can just be you writing down a few things and having a little light bulb goes off because you start putting things together, making those connections, seeing those patterns, right? So in my course of business, I managed a team of problem, sol problem solvers and we were that, you know, process improvement. But the thing I used to say to them all the time is what problem are you solving? And where's the data that says this is the best solution? Often in business and I think in life too, we come up with, we come up with things we want to do um, or or solutions to problems that are more about we love the solution, not because it's the right answer to the problem, right? A solution in search of a problem, I used to say all the time. Or problem is solution in search of a problem, right? I don't have a problem, but I have this great solution, so I gotta find a problem so I can implement or I can make this change. Yeah, that's not the way it works. Complex systems are hard to improve. There's a lot going on. There are individual inputs as well as the interactions of those inputs. So we use a system and you, my friend, are complicated, a complicated, you are a complicated system. So when we go to solve problems for ourselves, sure, sometimes they're simple, but sometimes they're complex. So I want to offer, well, I'm going to just tell you, but I'm not going to, it's big, took me a long time to learn it, but I'm just going to talk about it a little bit to maybe give you some ideas about it. So the first thing about a problem when you want to solve a problem, the very first thing to talk about is the problem. That's right. Now, Albert Einstein said, if I had 50 minutes to solve, a, if I had one hour to solve a problem, I would spend 50 minutes understanding the problem. Or I, I think he actually said 55. I would spend 55 minutes understanding the problem and five minutes uh, fixing the problem. 
because this is where I like to talk about the 80-20 rule, right? The 80-20 rule rules supreme through life. I can't explain it, but for most, for a lot of things, things fall into an 80-20 paradigm, right? There's the bulk of everything and there's the, the bulk of what's going on. And then there's the outliers. There's those things that are different. If you've ever seen a normal distribution, the bell curve, right? The bell curve, 80% of the data falls in the center. That's what we're talking about it is the 80-20 rule. But sometimes we use it badly. Sometimes people use the 80-20 rule badly. So for instance, if I apply it to problem solving, I would say your goal is to spend 80% of the time you have allotted to solving this problem to really understanding the problem, really getting in and knowing exactly what's going on and 20% solving it. But sadly, most of us are not trained like this, right? This is a deep manufacturing improvement rule. These are big uh, business performance ideas, but we don't talk about them. We're not trained on them, but the sad part is they actually are helpful to us. They actually do. Good morning. Good morning, Debbie. These 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 tools these tools are actually do apply in our daily lives. So I want to bring them down to a level that, or I want to talk about them on a level of personal use. So again, the 80-20 rule um, is we want to spend our time, not jump into a solution. Okay, I I don't have it's raining on me. I'm getting wet. My solution is find an umbrella, right? That's a very, well, okay, that's a bad solution. That's a bad example because it's too simple. But we want to define our problem in a way that just talks about the problem. One of the things that happens in problem solving is as soon as you start talking about the problem, you start talking about what's causing it. You start talking about how you're going to solve it, not defining the problem. So at the beginning, we want to avoid those things. And we just want to talk about the problem. We don't want to include any ideas that you have in mind. You might have a solution. It's raining. I'm, I don't have enough. Uh, uh, I find myself in the rain and I'm getting wet. Pretty sure the solution is going to be I'm going to get an umbrella, right? But when I'm talking about the problem, the problem is I'm getting wet. That is the problem. So we want to state the problem as simply as possible. And you do this. Uh, when, you, when you start talking about what's going on, what the problem is, or I mean, what the what the causes of the problem is or how you're going to solve it. You're really moving on to the next part of the discussion. So a saying we use is an imperfect solution to a well-defined problem is always far superior than a well-defined solution to an ill-defined problem. Now I'm going to say that again, because that is a kludgy statement that took me a long time to wrap my arms around, but here it is. Here it is. An imperfect solution to a well-defined problem is always superior to a well-defined solution for an ill-defined project. If we don't define the project very well, um, then we don't know if the solution is actually going to solve it. If you don't really know what you're going, what, what's causing it, the 80-20 rule says that 80% of what's going on in any system, process, life, is caused by 20% of what's of what the inputs, 20% of what the, the causes are. Now, if we if we follow this up, what this means is if we can figure out which 20% of what we're doing is causing that 80% of our troubles, well then with a with a very few small adjustments, with a very few perspective shifts, with some small changes, we can make big changes in the outcome, right? Because only because the secret is finding and identifying that 20%. You just go throwing spaghetti on the wall. If you just start throwing solutions at it, not really understanding it, even if you do get a little improvement, you might not be, you might not know what you did, which of those things you, you changed caused the change, caused the difference. So we want to create, we just want to understand our problem in terms of this. This is our current state. This is the gap. This is our future state. I find myself with low. I find myself with low energy. 
I used to have a lot of energy and enthusiasm for life. And I want to get back to where I was. I, I have low energy. The gap is the energy that used to be in my life is gone. And I don't know why that's my gap. I've lost my energy and I don't know why. And my solution is I want to get it back. It's very, very simple, but we want to put it into terms of here's what I found. Or here's, here's the statement of what's happening. Here's the gap of what I'm missing. What's the problem? The gap is the problem. All right. Let's say your problem. Uh, let, okay. Now, let's say your problem is, again, you feel yourself with low energy. You're not certain what caused it, but you want it back. You might say, boy, in 2021, I have much less energy, less energy and enthusiasm for life. That sounds like a good problem statement, right? But now I have to ask some questions. What? What is energy? How do I define energy? How am I defining energy and enthusiasm? How much less energy do I have? Is it a lot less? Is it a little less? Is it 50% less? Is it 80% less? How much is a good amount? How much energy do I need to have? How far below my, my goal am I? How, how do I know how much energy I actually have? I know it's low, but how do I, how do I know where it is and how much do I actually need? Okay. So, even a simple problem can spawn a lot of great questions that help you to answer the question of what is causing the problem, right? So that takes us to the next step. And that is we have to answer those questions. We just asked a bunch of questions. Well, how much is a good amount of energy? And, and uh, how, do I, how, am I, how do I know how much energy I have? And, and how am I defining this? So now we're going to answer these questions, right? Because now we're in the next phase. We got to measure our problem again. We now we're going to create data. Scary, right? Now we're just going to get some information and organize it. We're gonna, really simple trick. We're going to answer some questions. Who, what, when, where? Not why. We're not to why yet. But oh, what is happening? When is it happening? Where is it happening? To whom or who is around me when it is happening? Right? These are all questions that help me define that problem and you have to actually answer the questions you can't just ask them but when you ask the questions and then answer them boom start understanding your problem right so then we then we have to kind of say how are we going to like what is the way we're going to measure if we made an improvement what's our metric how do i say how much um energy i have right now versus how much I want to have versus how much is too much, right? So we're going to define it. This is what energy feels like to me. This is what I feel like when I'm having a high energy day. I'm, I'm happy and excited. I feel light on my feet. I feel um, confident and have a good outlook. So we're going to just get, you just have to understand, how do I know when I'm in the state that I'm trying to achieve, right? When I, and then if, if I say, I want more energy, or let's just say I want more happiness. So I'll, I'll change the metric for a little bit, change the discussion. I want more happiness, right? Again, more questions. Do I want more moments of happiness? Do I want more happiness in my happy moment? Because these are two different problems, right? And they might require two different solutions. So I got to be really clear about what problem am I solving right now? There's not enough happiness in my life. Does that mean that the happiness I have is not intense enough? Or does that mean there's my happiness to unhappiness ratio? Not that great. Right? So that is the, if I were to think, if I said I wanted more moments of happiness in my life, then my metric would be my happy to unhappy moments. It's ratio, right? I am happy 62% of the time, but we'll get to how, well, how would you get to that? measure it but you'd be saying i'm happy 60 percent of the time but i really want to be happy 80 percent of the time awesome you have a goal you have you know what to do you know and then we're going to define what is happiness how do i feel when i'm happy if i wanted to have intenser happinesses in my life then maybe i'm going to have to need to understand how happy am i in a happy moment and give it a rating system one through five uh, five i'm the most happiness ever one i'm the least happiest ever right that's all right 
that's all right. Um, but this is where we have to define it well so that you know exactly what problem you're solving. An ill-defined problem is one where you kind I want more happiness in my life without asking the follow-on questions. So now we know something. Now we've asked some, we've answered some questions, right? Now we've we've done our little project and we've we've defined what we want. We want more energy, more happiness, more whatever you want in your life, right? But less, less, uh, less arguing, less conflict. You can apply this to it, it's it's we're just going to take a metric and move it up or down i want more or i want more of something more desirable i want less of something that's undesirable easy 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 piece and now we've measured it right we've made a statement we've understand our problem we've answered and we've answered answered our questions and now we got a pretty good feeling of just what our problem is what it feels like what it looks like when it's happening we, we may not we don't know why it's happening yet. we don't know what we're going to do about it yet, but we know we know all about the problem right so now we're going to go to the next step. We're going to look for a little bit of a uh, root cause. Root cause analysis is the secret to everything. Sometimes we are just looking at symptoms, right? I want to tell you a quick, quick, really a little quick story that I learned in my business training that just illustrates this point. It's like, like no other way I've ever found out before. So we're all, we're all from, now see if I was, when I get really good at this, I would have been better prepared and I would have flashed up the Washington Monument. And, you know, for those, oh, I don't want to do that. Okay, so the Washington Monument. We all know the Washington Monument. It's the big marble obelisk in Washington, D.C., right? Well, the caretakers of the monument one day, they noticed that it was turning yellow. Mo the monument was turning yellow and they said, oh, that's interesting. Why is the monument turning yellow? They started to do their questioning. They started to sniff around and they found out that the caretakers washed the monument with soap every day and it was turning the monument yellow. Well, why were they? So they asked the question. This is the, the root cause analysis. You just keep asking why. Why? Well, why is that happening? Right. Well, why were they washing the monument? Well, it turns out some birds lived around the monument. And you know what happens when birds are around? Birds fly around and they leave bird droppings. So birds flew around, they left the bird droppings, washed the monument, monument turned yellow. So, well, we could shoot the birds, right? That's one solution. But no, let's keep asking why. Why are the birds around? Why are the birds hanging around on the monument? Well, it turns out a little spider that the birds love to eat live around the monument. Okay. The spiders live there, the birds eat them, they leave their droppings, we wash the monument, it turns yellow. So now we could kill the spiders, right? Or we could ask why. Why are the spiders hanging out around the monument? Well, it turns out a certain bush grows at the bottom of the monument and that attracts them and that attracts the spiders. Okay, the bush grows, the spiders come, the birds eat the spiders, the birds leave their droppings, wash the mo monument, the soap turns the monument yellow. We could kill all the spiders. That's a hard one, right? What was the solution? Easy. Take out the bushes, right? Take out the bushes, eliminate the spiders, eliminate the birds, eliminate the washing monument, stop turning yellow. Now, at any one of the other points on that story, if you had decided to solve that by killing the birds, killing the spiders, stop washing the monument, right? Or use a different soap. Those all would require continuous action. I'm still going to have to wash the monument. I'm still going to have to deal with the bird shit. I'm still going to have to deal with the spiders. But when you remove those bushes, took out the bushes, didn't call the spiders there, problem solved. We took out the root cause of the issue. And that is what we want to do in our lives, right? We want to get to the root of what's going on. So when we say, when we ask a question, well, I'm not very happy. Uh, well, that's a tough one. We're not going to go down that road. Anyway, when we do the five whys, um, we just keep asking one more. One more why. Well, why is that happening? Why is that happening? And the answers might not be easily available, or they might be in the work you just did working to understand the problem, right? So we go always go back to the data, to the answers for our questions. Problem solving is simply a series of asking questions and answering them and finding out the answers, right? Now, in the problem solving world, everything runs on an equation. That equation is very simple. It is 
the function of x, some set of inputs, right? So this is called f x equals y. I should write this down for you, but I did not prepare it. Some function of what we're doing gives us our output. Simple as that, right? Some function of the things we are doing every day gives us the outcome that we are either desiring or wanting to change. Again, if we can figure out which 20% of those inputs are causing our trouble, and that's what all this analysis is about, is understanding what we're doing that's causing what we're getting. Sometimes you find more problems when you start asking these questions, but that's okay. You're just getting more information. And sometimes it might take more than one solution. Sometimes when you have a problem, if you take something complex like happiness or energy, uh, it's probably not going to be a simple one answer solution. I don't have as much energy because it, after I do my analysis, I find out I have stopped exercising and going to yoga. I seem to have started watching more Netflix and doing less meditating. I mean, you know, you start uncovering the reasons, right? They may take a couple projects. Okay, I'm going to start needing to set time set for meditation every day. Okay, I'm going to set, I'm going to make sure I actually do the, the exercises I, I say I'm going to do. These are the solutions, right? This is the improvement. These are where you actually make the changes. You've spent all this time understanding your problem. You've understood the problem down to the nth degree. You know why it's, and now you actually, you've started asking these questions, why? But why is this happening? But why is this happening? So I defined my problem. I know exactly what's going. I, I defined my problem. So I say, this is specifically what I'm talking about. Not all these other things that could be. This is what's specifically what I'm talking about. Then I measured it, right? Then I created data. Then I organized information by asking who, what, when, where, how. And I, and then, and then I took the answers, then I took those answers and then I asked why, why does this happen? Why is this happening? Why is this happening? Until I got down to a root cause of something I can actually make a fundamental change on. And then you make the changes. And this is where the actual improvement work happens. But if you're, if you've done this well, this goes, this is easy. If you've, the, the, the truth is, if you have spent the time understanding the problem, measuring the problem, and drilling down on why it's happening, implementing the solution, kind of a no-brainer, right? You've just, put, you've just put together a story that gives you a, a little roadmap on the changes you want to make. You don't have to make them if you don't want to, but you're deciding from a place of knowledge. You're understanding what's going on, why you're feeling or not having or 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 having this problem of something uncomfortable that needs to be removed or something that you're missing that needs to be added back in. And then, uh, you know, like I said, it, this is the actual work and chunk it down. Sometimes we get overwhelmed with how big problems are. Maybe the changes aren't going to happen all at once. Maybe you change. I changed my life. I did my happiness problem. It was huge. It was huge. I ended up changing careers, uh, leaving a marriage, um, leaving some friends, uh, uh, adopting new activities in my life I hadn't done before. That didn't happen overnight. It was 10 years. It was a 10-year project, right? So not all problems are simple, but some are. Some problems Anyway, I'm, I'm rambling now. Um, I'm just going to be, uh, I'll, kid Debbie, I'm just going to confess to you what happened. I was supposed to have a guest today, Amber Rose, and she had to cancel. She had um, her, her very dear little dog uh, got severely sick and she had to care for him. And we decided, decided to reschedule the show until next week. And so I found myself this morning with uh, unprepared, unprepared for a show. And so I thought I'd talk about something that I I know something about problem solving because it was my career for 25 years. And because in spite of the fact that this morning's battle was not as well organized as I would have liked because I wrote it in the 30 minutes before the show. Um, I am an expert problem solver. I have done 200 over 250 problem solving projects. I've saved companies over $12 million um, by making process improvements that, 
made changes. Sometimes things are so simple. We just, we just, uh, we just need to see them through. That's why I love, that's why I love the process. The pro, they used to call me the process queen. I seem to be the queen wherever I go. But it was the process queen because I love a process. I love a process map. I love a step-by-step -step instruction. Process is simply a set of repeatable steps with an expected outcome, right? You can make a process for how to make a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. And if you want to make a consistently the same, let's say you, you finally get the perfect peanut butter and jelly combination. You know exactly everything you want. Well, there is going to be a process so that you create that exact same sandwich every time. Variation is the enemy of quality, right? That's all that quality is all about is, is consistent performance. That's the definition of quality. To set a standard and meet a standard to a percentage that is acceptable to all. So anyway, this is my babble this morning. It's, I, oh my God, I talked for 30 minutes about nothing. I don't know. Did you find it helpful? I'd love to know if you found this helpful or if it was just goofy. Uh, these are important things to me. Problem solving, using a process, uh, process improvement. My understanding of the, the tool that I was given by spending 10, 20 years understanding and living a process that I understand it so well now that, like I said, colors the way I look at things. I see everything in the terms of, of um, how it's created, how it can be improved. So we'll talk about this more. There's more coming. It's called the happiness process where I'm going to take all, where I'm taking all of these things I'm talking about, applying them to your happiness and giving tools. We talk about tools for happiness every day. This is a process or happiness. Coming soon. Anyway, thanks for listening. Make it a happy day.